Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPIC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters on KPFT Houston. I'm Chris Hensley. The time is now 11 a.m. is what I'm so used to saying every Friday morning, but we are once again broadcasting live from a bedroom here at my house while on quarantine in lockdown in Houston. <laughs> uh, we have a fantastic uh, guest with us today, uh, Maria Konakova. Uh, she is the author of the book, The Biggest Bluff. It has been described as how a New York Times bestselling author and a New York New Yorker contributor parlayed a strong grasp of the science of human decision making and a woeful ignorance of cards into a life changing run as a professional poker player under the wing of a legend of the game. So please stay tuned. Uh, keep listening. We will do a deep dive into this new uh, newest book, The Biggest Bluff. Uh, if you are a longtime listener, you know we always reserve just the first few moments to tell you a little bit about what's going going on uh, here in Houston and the Gulf Coast area when it comes to financial literacy. Uh, and I could say not much <laughs> right now, uh, being part of the Houston Money Week, Week uh, leadership team. Uh, you've heard me talk about this in the past. We go out to different companies, organizations, schools, uh, uh, city, local city government, and do free educational workshops during the month of April for financial literacy. However, uh, because of COVID-19 this year, that has had to drastically change. All of our uh, uh, workshops and seminars went to online learning. So I'm mentioning this because this week we actually had a leadership team meeting, uh, and we are already starting to talk about 2021 uh, and what that's going to look like. And where we've gone out and talked about general financial literacy, a lot of people are in crisis mode right now. And so kind of directing the, the uh, workshops and educational seminars to that. I would point people to our website, which is HoustonMoneyWeek.org. Uh, you can find out how to get involved, uh, and you can also put your zip code in there, and it'll tell you local resources that are available through the United Way's 411 line as they are as a, a partner as well. Okay, with that being said, thank you, uh, uh, Maria, for waiting very patiently as we get through that. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to, to the uh, listeners here. Um, and so let me do that now, uh, because you are, interestingly enough, we, we know this book is uh, in, it's about poker, uh, but the, your background and the way that you came into it is a lot different than a lot of people who get into poker. Uh, you're the author of a New York Times best, uh, bestselling book. Books, the Confidence Game, uh, winner of the 2016 Robert P. Ball's Price and Critical Thinking. Um, and, and from listening to the book, uh, you were freelance journalist going into this. So you weren't a professional poker player going into this. This was more of a kind of a, um, an, uh, a learning experience there. Uh, before we get too far in there, is there something you could tell us uh, about yourself separate from what I just shared with listeners so that we can get to know you a little bit better? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm someone who has always followed my interests, even when I wasn't quite sure where they were going to lead. Um, so when I was in school, I studied um, not just writing, but psychology, um, and ended up working in television of all places, and then going to get a PhD in psychology, even though I never had any interest in going into academia. So I just did it because I love the human brain and I had no idea how I was gonna use it, but I wanted to learn more. And of course that ended up translating into the lens through which I view a lot of my own writing. And the only thing that I've done full time since then has been write other than play poker. And that was that was something that I never expected um, to, to happen in my life. Um, something you didn't say about me that people wouldn't know um, is that I'm someone who doesn't like games. I wow. did not grow up playing any games. So not just card games. I don't like board games. When my nieces and nephews, you know, pull out that Travelers of Catan, yeah, I just yeah. I have this feeling of absolute dread. <laughs> Am I going to actually have to play this? 
Wow, wow. So poker doesn't really fit in. Yeah, so fast forward to then, uh, and and you are sitting at the table with the, so, you know, what many people often look at as the guy uh, when it comes to poker. So uh, I guess that's a good way to get into it. I, I like the idea, the psychology, and and one of the things you mentioned in the book is that you, you got there through reading and and then game theory, and this all kind of like. Um, unfolded there uh but but go a little bit deeper into into that how the the book uh which the subtitle on it here is uh, and i'm really big into skill acquisition so this <laughs> kind of popped out to me the biggest bluff how i learned to pay attention master myself and win how did you go from that to this <laughs> Yeah, um, I became really interested in the role that luck plays in our lives and learning to tell the difference between skill and chance, between the things that we can control and the things that we can't control. Um, and as you mentioned, um, I was reading a lot. So whenever I'm interested in something new, whenever I decide I want to take on a new project, and it can be as short as, you know, short piece in a newspaper or a magazine article, or in this case, a book. I read, that's that's what I do first of all. I mean, I think that writers should first of all be readers. And for everything I write, I've read so much more than I can, than I can share with the world. And one of the things that I came across as I was reading about chance and trying to figure out how am I going to actually write about this topic was the foundational book of game theory. So John von Neumann's theory of games and economic behavior. And I learned that von Neumann, who is one of the great minds of the 20th century, father of game theory, father of the computer, father of the hydrogen bomb, so lots of different things, um, brilliant mind. Um, he was a poker player and game theory was born from poker. And the way that he described the game really intrigued me. It made me want to learn more because he saw it as this perfect analog for decision making in real life, for playing a game that could help you then make some of the most difficult strategic decisions in a decidedly non-game context. I mean, he thought that if you could solve poker, that you would prevent nuclear war, that you would solve kind of the most pressing problems facing humans. And the reason he thought that was that poker was a game that resembled life. It was a game of incomplete information, of knowns and unknowns, of probabilistic choices where you have to make the best decision you can with limited information and you're never 100% certain of the outcome. All you can do is put yourself in a position to get a good outcome, but because there's unknown information, you're never going to know for sure. And he said, that's life. Chess isn't life. Chess is a game where there's always a right answer. There's always a right move. There's always something that is the specific thing that you're supposed to do. And if you give me enough computing power, I'll tell you what the move is. That's not true of life. And that's not true of poker. And chess has been solved and poker hasn't been solved by, by computers in, in modern times. So when I was reading all of this, I thought, what is this poker thing? You know, I, I had no idea what poker was. I'd seen Rounders. That's about it. It's, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you should go watch it. Um, but that was my, that was my entire knowledge of poker was Rounders. So to me, it was this complete unknown and, I decided to see what I could find. And when I started reading about poker, something just clicked in my head and I thought, this is my next book. I want to learn how to play this game. I want to get one of the best players in the world to teach me. And I want to see what happens. I want to use that journey as a way to explore these themes of skill and chance. So I love it because I, I uh, a lot of as a financial advisor, a lot of the things that you just mentioned are hitting, hitting uh, checking off a mark for me here. <laughs> the ga game theory, uh, decision making, chance versus skill. Uh, what role does luck have to play? Uh, the fact that you're a writer uh, as a uh, host of the show. A lot of times when I have a guest on, I like to do the cliff notes version well i'll go in there and i'll listen to part of the audio the problem with that when i actually run into somebody who is a good writer is you had me in the first paragraph there uh the description of going into the casino and the ain't nervous energy as people walked in uh, and so to hear that kind of filter through somebody who's a really good writer is it just kind of immediately draws me in so 
fast forwarding to part of that was actually choosing a game. So the game choice, you ended up with uh, Texas Hold'em. Uh, we're here in Texas. <laughs> For people who don't, who, don't, who don't know much about poker, uh, why did you end up going with that specific game? Sure. There were, there were a lot of reasons, um, one of which is that it happens to be the most widespread variant right now. But there's a reason for that as well. Um, and there's a reason why John von Neumann recommended that this that this be kind of the approach that you take. Um, and that's the exact balance of knowns to unknowns. So in Texas Hold'em, there are two whole cards, and those are the private cards that only you can see. And the rest of the cards, which is going to be, if you stay until the end of the hand, five in total are going to be face up. And he said that two and five, that's a perfect balance where you actually have enough skill that it's a skill game, but there's still this element of chance. Now, in some other variants, there are too many unknowns. So there are five cards that no one sees that each player has. So that's just too much of a guessing game. It becomes too much of a casino crapshoot actual craps shoot <laughs> where, where it comes from. Yep. <laughs> We're playing craps on a table. And if you have too little information, so there are some variants of poker where there's just one whole card. So everyone just has one card that's on and he said, well, now it becomes too much like chess, it becomes too mathematical. There are too many known variables and too little that is secret, that is hidden, that you have to infer. And he, he thought that this variant Hold'em, Texas Hold'em, was a really nice balance of the two things. And what's more, it's not just any Hold'em, it's no limit Hold'em. So there's also a variant called limit, where you're limited in how much you can bet. That's not life. In life, there's never anything stopping you from betting as much as you want on anything. You know, you can always risk everything. You can risk your life if you want to. Um, and so no limit is the is the way to go. And so that's why I decided to choose that specific aspect of the game. And obviously, I knew I'd be talking to you. And so I wanted to be able to talk about Texas Hold'em to somebody in Texas. There you go. There you go. Well, and, and, you know, one of the things you just mentioned was the having no limit. Uh, that means that people can go all in. What does that mean to go all in? It means you're betting everything you have. So you're betting all of the chips that you have. Um, I play tournament poker and not cash games. So that means that the chips have no cash value. You buy in for a certain amount, and then the chips are just a way of keeping score, of, of figuring out where you stand relative to other players. And the ability to go all in means that you can wager all of those chips at any given point in time when you're in a hand. And in other variants where there is a limit, you can't do that. You're always artificially constrained in how much you can bet. Now, one of the things that as you decided to do this, you went out and sought somebody who was considered a master when it comes to poker, uh, Eric Seidel. Um, tell us about that experience. I didn't know what I was quite getting into in asking <laughs> Eric because at that point, as I already said, I knew nothing about poker. And so I had done some preliminary research and I identified him as my top choice because he was really the only person who'd been around since the 80s for over 30 years and still winning at the highest levels. And that clearly marked him as someone who was worthy of approach. He was someone from an older generation, so someone who used more psychology, which is my own background, so I wanted someone who'd match my abilities. And he was someone who seemed like a really nice guy. And that's important if you're going to be spending a lot of time with someone. What I didn't know was that he's never taken students was that wow. you know he was notoriously reticent didn't like sharing his secrets or anything like that so i was i would have probably been a little bit intimidated i was already intimidated but even more intimidated had i known that um luckily i didn't so i thought you know let me let me cold call him i'm a journalist that's what i do um so i just approached him out of the blue and said hey you know i'm working on something new i'm a writer for the new yorker um and i'd love to talk to you i think that it's something you might be interested in. And I didn't say anything more than that. And he wrote back and he actually, I got very, very lucky. He's not only a poker player, he's that rare poker player who doesn't just know what the New Yorker is, but who reads the New Yorker. And he knew nice. who I was. And he uh, said, oh, I love your writing. Let's absolutely talk. Um, so, so I got very lucky. I didn't know just how remarkable Eric was, but he is. <laughs> 
Wow, wow. So I, I know, and there's, you know, when people think about math, uh, I think one of the comments in the book was that the people who are easily manipulated go deep into math, which was an odd statement, but I, <laughs> I you, that was in the book. Um, but you also talk about you, you were worried that maybe you didn't have enough math skills to do this. And then Eric said, so what, what, what is that about? Yeah, so so there are two questions there. Let's start with the second one, which is me wor being worried that I didn't have enough math skills. I, I was worried about that because I haven't taken a math class since high school. I'm a writer. I've never I haven't never used math in my professional life. Um, and he said, you know, it's it's not a big deal because I really was nervous. I thought maybe I'm not actually going to be able to do this because I don't have math skills. And he said, you know, neither do I. The math is so simple that. <laughs> You know, as long as you have a sixth grade understanding of addition and subtraction and multiplication and division, you'll be fine. And he was right, um, because you don't have to do complex calculations at the table. You need to learn how to figure out outs and pod odds and, and things like that. But you don't have to be solving differential equations or, <laughs> or anything complicated. And so, and so he set my mind at rest when it came to that. But the the other part, what you started with, was how some of the players who are the most mathy are the easiest to manipulate. And I think that comes, those aren't the best players in the world. The best ones know, know what's up. The ones who put a little bit too much faith in the mathematics can be led astray because they become very inflexible. They become overconfident that they know the right answer, that they know exactly how they're supposed to play. And maybe they do in a vacuum, but they're not playing in a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're playing against people. And so if you figure out what they, that this is someone who is just a very, in, very inflexible, this is someone who is just who thinks that math is everything and that you don't need psychology at all and is someone who's not paying attention to the people at all because they think that it's not important, then that's a person who's much easier to exploit. How did, so we talked about the math piece of it, we talked about the psych psychology piece of it. Uh, how did that psychology background come into play when you actually got out there and started sitting down and playing the game? Oh, in every single element. I mean, I studied decision making under conditions of risk and uncertainty and I studied self-control. Um, so I studied the types of things that are actually very pertinent in this specific environment. And so I had going in, I think I had a vocabulary that helped me conceptualize what was going on in a way that made me better able to respond to it and to learn and to improve myself because I knew what I was seeing. I already knew what these biases were. That doesn't mean that they didn't affect me. They didn't, that doesn't mean that, you know, I sat down and I was perfectly in control of my psychology. Absolutely not. But it does mean that I had the knowledge to identify what the problems were, to identify what I was seeing in other people, to know what I should be looking out for. And I had the resources to be able to start working on it and adjusting and figuring out how do I approach this? How do I put my theoretical knowledge into practice? And that's not a natural transition because there is, there's a big divide between theory and practice. Knowing th something in theory doesn't mean you're going to be able to execute it. And poker really puts you to the test because you're in a very high pressure environment. You have to make decisions quickly. You have to make weighty decisions quickly, ones that matter, under time pressure, under emotional pressure. You're exhausted. You're sitting there for hours. If you play tournament poker, you know, you're playing 12, 13, 14 hour days. And then you have to go to sleep and wake up and do it all over again because all the big tournaments last multiple days and if you're if you're still in it you're still in it and there's nothing you can do about it and so you really have to have a good handle on yourself because when a human mind is exhausted when a human body is exhausted decision making suffers and uh, emotional control suffers and a lot of those things that we take for granted basically go out the window. I like to say that everyone's everyone's garbage will come out one one time or another at the poker table. <laughs> Everything you carry around with you at some point is going to come out. So you better deal with it.
I love it. I love it. I uh, I am not a poker player, but I'm fascinated with the whole thought process behind this. Now, I do have a buddy, Steve, who's a poker player, uh, and he sat at the World Series table before. And so part of my research before we got on the phone here <laughs> was I called him. And it's like, what would you? And, and he, he just talked about the sacrifice of the time that it takes as you lead up to the tournament and the actual, you know, two week period of that. It's grueling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what roadblock for people like myself who don't really know a lot about it. What are some of those roadblocks that you ran into as you went through this journey and experience that you'd like to share with us? I think the biggest one, and there were lots, but, but let me just focus on one. Um, was the fact that I didn't quite realize how much I'd internalized a lot of gender stereotypes that society throws at me um, and that I'd internalized a lot of the behaviors that are expected of me as a woman um, in a way that's not exactly flattering to me, not a way that I'd like to see myself. And that prevented me from being able to play well. So poker is, for people who don't play, 97% male. I mean, wow. just think about that wow. number for a second. Yeah. 97% means that you can go days and weeks without seeing another woman. I mean, 3% is not a lot. And and that that filters down into the norms of behavior and into how people act. And... What I found was at the beginning, you know, I would let myself be bullied. People would bully me and I'd say, okay, you know, I don't want conflict. I don't want to deal with it. I'll just take a step back. I wasn't bluffing enough. Even in situations where I knew I should bluff, I couldn't get up the courage to do it because it was so counter to the image that I wanted to project of myself. When I had strong hands, I didn't bet as aggressively as I should have. So I didn't even make as much money with my good hands because I didn't want people to mislike me, to think that I was being too aggressive. So I, and that's, that's terrible. That's not a way to play poker, especially when I knew I was making mistakes, but I was making them anyway, because something inside me was a roadblock. And the something was socialization. It was internalizing a lot of these norms of behavior for women that have been thrown at me for my entire life. And so once I realized that, first of all, it wasn't a pleasant realization, but then I could start working on it. And I did. And once I realized what was happening, I also realized that I was being underestimated, that people were seeing me as a as a female, not as a player. And that could be my superpower, that being underestimated could actually be something that I could really turn on its head and use to my advantage. And I did. And that's when I started winning. I love it. I love it. So everything that you mentioned right now could be translated past poker. Uh, to, sure. to, to go right into life. I mean, you started with, we talked about gender stereotypes and just really the socialization, those patterns that we see in society as a large uh, on a micro level here in poker. It's, it, you know, when there's 3% women, that, that that's going to be a thing. <laughs> you're you're going to see those things amplified in that game. And so some of the things you talked about were, were bullying. We see that in life outside of poker. Uh, Bluffing, and that's one of the reasons you picked Texas Hold'em was because you're able to, uh, you can actually bluff in that game. And other games of chance or, or, or um, chess, for instance, you can't necessarily bluff all the time. You mentioned not being able to be, you know, as aggressive. Uh, these these social these these patterns that we see uh, bubbling up. This is all a lot of information. We've only got two minutes before, before the end of the show here. So uh, I would encourage listeners. Uh, we just barely even skimmed the top of the, the, the topic here. I'd encourage listeners to go, to go out and get a copy of the book. Uh, I downloaded it on audible, which it's available. Uh, uh, fantastic information. Uh, wh where else could they go to find out more about you, your writing uh, and, and just information if they're interested? Absolutely. Um, so I have a website, which is just my full name, MariaKonnikova.com. And I'm most active on Twitter as MKonnikova. And I'm also on Instagram, where I'm girl named Maria, but girl doesn't have an I. Um, not because I can't spell, but because someone had already snagged the, the username <laughs> with the girl named Maria. So it's just girl named Maria. Um, and there I have links to where you can buy my book, which is wherever books are sold. And if you're getting a physical copy, I urge you all to support your local bookstores and get it from an independent seller. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So if you're driving, you don't have to write all that down. I'll have a link to that on the podcast note as well. Uh, and then, Maria, in the last minute that we have here, is there anything that I forgot to ask you that you'd like to leave with listeners today? I'd just like to leave people with the idea that, you know, even though you can't control everything and chance is a big part of life, poker teaches you to really focus on the process, on the things that you can control rather than the outcome, which is what you can't control. So if you have that kind of mindset, I think it's a very helpful one. It's one that helps us get through a lot of uncertain moments, um, which is especially relevant for a moment like today. I love it. I love it. And we'll leave it there. What a great place to stop. Maria, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me.